Yes, hello. It's my pleasure to be here as well today. I think that uh, for me, and uh, I have, uh, I, I started off in uh, with my first degree at the University of Western Ontario, and then went on and did uh, law school in Toronto, and then uh, civil law in Montreal, and then uh, went off to. Uh, I did a little work with the Department of Justice Canada in Quebec, and then I went off to. Uh, to Arizona, where I did my master's and, and graduate work, my PhD, and then uh, and also was a, a professor of law there and a senior research fellow. And uh, so that gave me a lot of opportunity to travel around the world and work with Indigenous groups in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, up in Norway, I was a, a censor for their master's program up at the University of Tromso. And uh, and various other places in the world on on human rights issues and mostly indigenous rights, and did uh, court cases as as we said in uh, with the Toledo Mayan uh, people and uh, and the Awastini people in Nicaragua in the in the Organization of American States, the Inter uh, American uh, Court there in uh, San Jose. So. Um, Definitely had a lot of exposure to the subject and indigenous uh, uh, justice and, and of course, uh, the type of innovations and probably uh, what uh, spurred me on was working with a lot of the tribal courts in Arizona with my uh, time there at the University of Arizona at the law school there. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of different tribal courts and some of them in uh, as early as 2003 were using uh paperless courtrooms where they would walk in and all the documents would be scanned and come up on screens and the chief judges would uh, sit in their uh, and the coordinating judges would sit in their offices and have monitors in each courtroom and and follow the proceedings and uh, and that so it was uh, definitely uh, an interesting time in in Arizona as the tribal courts were developing and they were employing technology uh, to uh, to kind of get to uh, as a vehicle uh, for access to justice. So uh, where after that, I came back to uh, the uh, uh, Quebec and that because my parents were, were getting older and uh, needed someone there. I should have taken them to Arizona. It was a lot warmer, <laughs> but, uh, and when I came back, I worked for the executive office of the, of the grand chief. And we worked on a number of, uh, of new relationship agreements with Quebec and Canada and that, and then I moved we created the Department of Justice that uh, that we'll talk a little bit about today and, and how we uh, imbued in that a little bit of uh, technology and innovation uh, and, and also try to address some of the uh, uh, systemic problems that have caused uh, issues. So here we go, a nice beautiful view of our coastline there and our freighters. So here we go, uh, Garin, if you wanna go forward with the slides. So as we know, there's access to justice and we know that there's been a lot of barriers, uh, race, culture, gender, language, disability, income, geographical location. I think uh, for us, the geographical location or the distance to, to the hub of where uh, justice, uh, where the judicial district is housed, it has been a, a very uh, big issue. Uh, you know, our territory is about half the size of France. And so it can take 18 hours to get from one community to the other by driving. And so uh, distances for an access to have judges, there are no judges within our uh, territory. And so they have to come from the South and, and therefore to have accessible justice uh, has been an issue, the geographical uh, issue. Of course, language is always an issue whenever uh, there is a court that's happening in, in the Cree language, there isn't a word for guilty. The closest word is confused. And if you're put before a judge and there's a hearing and formalities uh, that you're not used to, many people have not been away from the remote communities. Of course, if someone asks you if you're confused, you probably say, yes, you are confused. And so language, very key in trying to create a fair and just process which begs the questions of how fair and just was it before uh, we created the department and started looking at these issues. Um, indigenous people, of course, as you know, are very vulnerable. There's a poverty line there. There's a lack of access to 
resources. Uh, there, you know, I was a part of the initiative when I was in the uh, the Grand Chief's office to push to create a fiber optic network throughout uh, uh, the communities. And that was probably in 2005 when we created that. No, maybe 2007 when we started creating that, making a deal with uh, Hydro Quebec to exchange uh, some of their lines, some of their fiber optic lines that they use to monitor uh, the uh, uh, the dams and their operations. And so some of the lines weren't being used. And so we made a deal to take over those lines and create fiber optics to the communities, which then which then allowed us to start employing innovation. Uh, there. So uh, there has been a lot in the history, as you know, of direct and industri- in indirect discrimination and uh, systemic, which means that within the system, there was a way of doing things or a way of uh, ignoring things uh, that, uh, that allowed for vulnerable people's voice to be marginalized or, or not heard. And that remains within the system. Uh, I put a link in here to the VN Commission, which came in And it looked at a lot of the issues that were happening with Indigenous peoples in Quebec and showed that, yes, there was systemic discrimination. There was a lot of areas when frontline services uh, where uh, Indigenous, uh, I guess, rights or issues were not being uh, done seriously. So it would mean that if someone would go to a police officer or to a hospital to and there may have been some sort of uh, harmful activity or criminal activity associated, it might not go anywhere. It would just uh, just seem to disappear or, or there might not be follow-up even if people were missing or if, uh, if there was a serious car- crime committed, uh, if you compared it to non-Indigenous people. Uh, there would be uh, definitely, uh, you know, the VN Commission found that there were definitely was a, a difference, a, mar- a, a notable difference that was happening between uh, the two. So, you know, we know that there's also that to deal with the, the systemic uh, discrimination that remains within the system and how uh, Indigenous peoples are viewed or treated in the frontline services, including whether or not you're the accused or a victim, you may be Uh, treated as poorly. Go forward, uh, Karen. There we go. And and we know that right now that Indigenous women are the highest growing population within Canadian prisons, but overall, Indigenous men and women make up about 32% of the country's federal inmates. So way back when, when uh, Alan Rock was Minister of Justice in uh, 1995, he made a statement that Canada was in crisis because 10% of the population of of the federal prisons were uh, Indigenous, while they only made up 3% of the population. So now, if you look at the Office of, uh, uh, of the Correctional Investigator, like Dr. Ivan Zinger or... Uh, or as predecessor, uh, there uh, were much higher now. We were at 25% a few years ago, and now we're at 32%. So regardless of pointing an issue here, the system keeps on uh, incarcerating more and more Indigenous people, regardless if in 95, we put a provision in the Criminal Code of Canada to encourage or to allow judges to look for alternative measures to not put Indigenous people in detention, and it continues. And of course, if you look at, I think it was the University of Laval did a nice report in Val d'Or uh, that the police disproportionately gave fines to homeless indigenous people in Val d'Or. And it ended up that those fines accumulated interest and eventually a uh, simple vagrancy fines uh, put them in f- into uh, federal detention, which is two years plus a day. So because they couldn't afford to pay for the fines and they were repeatedly handed out tickets at a disproportionate amount, they were now incarcerated in uh, in, uh, uh, long-term facilities because of of fines. So there's another good study there to look at. Okay, so we'll go forward. So... Uh, for us, we want to we want to change all this, right? We want to decolonize the system. We started creating partnerships 
uh, with indigenous governments and groups. We, we try to reconcile. So we work closely with the judiciary. We work uh, with other groups. Of course, for us, that meant as soon as I created the um, the vehicle for uh, the fiber optics that would come into the communities, the first thing I did was, uh, as I was building uh, our uh, our justice facilities that would house our courts, is I put within the walls uh, fiber optics leading throughout the building. So, uh, so as soon as the community was able to connect to the EU communications network fiber optic system that we had piggybacked off of Hydro Quebec, uh, we um, we were able to connect up our, our facilities to have these high. Um, you know, well, fiber optic uh, type of communication systems within there, uh, video conferencing systems with codexes. We went for the latest and the best we could find with commercial screens and everything else that we could do to make sure that these buildings uh, brought in uh, greater accessibility to justice and created an environment whereby uh, there could be more meetings, there could be more hearings, there could be uh, and they would be more timely. There could be, and it would lead to less hardship on individuals having to be transported, uh, you know, 12 hours to hear whether or not they should be incarcerated in the first place to have a bail hearing. So for us, it was an investment in technology, but it was also feeding off the fact that I had uh, I witnessed a lot of this in Arizona, that uh, the use of innovation and technology could uh, allow for, I guess, to take away some of those barriers, uh, to allow for more clearer understanding. Of course, we created uh, interpretation boosts, and so we could do simultaneous translation. And so we had a number of translators in the court to try and make sure that the processes were uh, more fair and just. Okay, uh, Karine. Yeah, and so uh, basically in 75, we had a table. So when the James Bay uh, Agreement was put together, so as you know, in the early 70s, uh, Robert Brass has said, oh, we're going to create the, you know, these wonderful dams and create uh, hydroelectricity and we're going to create this great economy in Quebec and we don't have to worry about anything because no one lives in the north. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the Crees lived in the north at the time and a, a few other indigenous groups. And in uh, 1918, what Quebec used to only really be along the St. Lawrence River. And it was much like most of Canada. It, it followed the major traffic ways. And so there wasn't, you know, in the north, it was mostly the fur trade was the only economy. It was, it was called Rupert's Land. And so in 1918, when Quebec wanted to annex or, or bring in a north part and expand the size of the province from not only the little strip that went from Trois-Rivières to Quebec City to Montreal to Gatineau, they, they wanted to, you know, have more area. In the 1918 Boundaries and Extension Act, it says that they had to take into consideration the rights and interests of the Indigenous people that lived in the north. Uh, Mr. Brass at the time did not read that or, or know that. And so it went to court and Judge Maloff at the first entrance said, uh, no, the rights exist there and uh, and granted the injunctions to stop it. And then at the time, the, the National Assembly then, uh, you know, uh, tried to remove the decision and then started negotiation and created with decrees and created, a, a, you know, 11 point agreement of understanding. And then from there, you know, created the very first modern day treaty. And during that, uh, there was a table dedicated to justice and, uh, and that created section 18, which then allowed us to create a blueprint of how the justice system should be adjusted. Um, so this is, uh, this is where we've worked from. Okay, Karen. So a little bit about EUSG, you can see a map there, like I said, a half the size of France, it's about 400,000 plus square uh, kilometers, and it's, uh, there's about 20,000 people. EUSG means the people's land or, you know, EU or the people of the land or human beings. 
Uh, there were over 300 trap lines with traditional activities happening. It's uh, governed by uh, chief and councils. Each of those little red areas are where the communities are. Um, and uh, there are also, so there are nine communities as far as uh, the, the northern one is Wamextu, which is uh, we, when we built our justice facility and we built our court there, uh, the government of Quebec asked that we could also host Inuit trials from uh, Kujarapik and the surrounding Inuit communities as well. So that's probably one of the busiest ones because we have two nations being served there. But uh, other than that, Cheshby is uh, is our larger one just underneath. And then you can see Miss Disney with the big lake uh, at the bottom uh, right. Too. So these are the bigger areas. These communities have about five or 6,000 in them. Okay, Karen. So uh, we created, uh, obviously, a nation-to-nation -nation partnership with Quebec. We started working uh, in 1975. We created the Triparte Agreement. Um, and then in 1982, we worked over and, and we, well, of course, we had the Canadian uh, Constitution come in place uh, with Section 35 and 25. And then in 84, we had our own self-government uh, agreement where we moved away from the Indian Act and uh, and moved into more self-determination and giving more power to local governments. And then in uh, 2007, uh, with a realization that a lot of Section 18 hadn't been implemented well yet, we created a new relationship with Quebec for the realization of what Section 18 would be. And during that, we, cre we invigorated the Judicial Advisory Committee with Quebec and Cree Nation representative equal representation and allowed for us to also modernize it uh, somewhat. So what was created in 75 created a blueprint, but there were things in 75 that didn't exist or, or um, now that, that didn't exist in 75, but now existed such as crime prevention. So in order for us to bring something like that in, we needed a judicial advisory committee that could breathe a little bit of life into it as justice evolved. And of course, uh, technology. Technology was something new that we were investing in. And of course, that the technology in 75, uh, I think those computers there took up whole buildings. So we had to, we had to needed some sort of body to help us uh, realize uh, how we would advance and use technology to, uh, to, to really work with justice. Okay, Karen. So I kind of went through these. These are the milestones. We can go on from here. So uh, with Section 18, as I said, it went into and it created a judicial district. Like I said, it's housed in the southern part of the territory. So in the, in the city of Amos. In the, in, and so uh, it's still a, a great distance from some of the communities uh, like Cheshire would be about an 18 hour drive. Uh, the court uh, travels around. It's an itinerant court to the Cree community. So if you're a large community, you get to see them, you know, at least once a month. But if you're a small community, uh, you might only see them three or four times a year. And so in between what happens with justice. So uh, you have, uh, we have programs also for young offenders, the homeless, the women's shelters, rehabilitation centers. Uh, these were all included in, in section 75. Uh, and most of them were unimplemented until, until we had our new agreement. Um, the institutions, so judges and courts had to take, had to integrate Cree values and customs. Uh, they had to take training to become familiar and their decisions had to reflect that. And all decisions, uh, had to be provided if requested by the individual in the Cree language. So language being important uh, there. So it couldn't just be a written decision in French or English. It would have to be orally given in Cree as well. So also in, in, uh, in 75, most Crees should be recruited and trained as well as to be justice of the peace. We did have a time when Quebec started training justice of the peace in, in the 80s. And then in the 90s, as they were supposed to start, 
delivering justice in the communities, a little thing called the referendum happened that kind of interfered with a little bit of relationships. And then we never got any Cree justices. They never ended up uh, administering uh, over any courts. Um, and like I said, the Cree Quebec Judicial Advisory Committee is uh, to facilitate partnerships. And so they're very key members in Quebec. There's a member that comes from corrections, one from policing, uh, one from the Department of Justice, and uh, so and one from the SAA, Aboriginal Affairs. And in our part, it's, uh, you know, the Deputy Grand Chief and some of the key chiefs and that, that sit on it and, and help us uh, uh, decide the direction and the areas that we're going to do innovation and research in. All right. Karen. So here's some of the values. You can see these on the websites. You know, we just really wanted to do accessibility to the justice system. We wanted to make sure traditional values are in there. The only way that justice can truly reflect is if someone can see themselves in them. Uh, so it shouldn't be a foreign system. It shouldn't be one that has foreign values. Indigenous people, that's why we have the United Nations Declaration on the Rights and Interests of Indigenous Peoples is because it's collective. There's a lot of collective rights uh, that are enumerated in there. And that's the reason why the United Nations uh, Human Rights uh, Declaration that was in the 40s, that was individual based, it wouldn't be a lot of countries or states didn't apply it to Indigenous peoples. And so collective rights were only brought in when the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples came through. Uh, so we look at crime, uh, crime and victimization, and we try and do that. It says we provide quality students, but we try and ensure them because we work in partnership with, uh, with the courts of Quebec and the Superior Court and the Federal Court and, and uh, other tribunals that, uh, that come up north. We host them. And of course, we've created our own tribunals. Uh, and of course, we're looking at providing more restorative treatment for indigenous peoples, which includes, uh, you know, ensuring that uh, through our video conferencing system that families can meet with people that are in detention. Sometimes they lose a parent and, uh, and family wants to reach out. We can send someone in to, to, to tell them the news, but family would rather do it themselves for, for hard news like that. And so, we have the ability with our courthouses and with uh, the fiber optics and the and the systems we use to connect to any uh, to any of the detention facilities, so that we can deliver the news and and of course we we go and we collect them physically to bring them back for the funeral. And that but you know very important to have that connection at certain times in their life. All right, Karine. We have nine facilities. We built two women's shelters because that was in 1975. Now it's under a different part. I think it's under the Ministry of Health and Social Services in Quebec. But in 75, that used to be under the Ministry of Justice. So we continue to, to operate that under our department. And we built recently a youth healing center, which is basically for open and closed custody. It can hold up to 26 uh, well, young men and young women at various levels of, uh, of seriousness for their offenses and, and put them in isolation. All right, go forward. Uh, we do a lot of partnerships with all the Cree First Nations, uh, the Cree Health Board, because we, we work with uh, youth protection uh, services and we work with the Young Offenders Act. We work with the Cree School Board, that's our crime prevention part. We're in every single school. So we work with you know a couple thousand children a year on crime prevention, uh, cognitive behavior therapy type of uh, lessons with them. And we try and look at innovative ways to interact with them and to reach, the, reach with them. So we use a lot of social media and a lot of, uh, because of course they're all hooked up with technology. We think of ways on how we can connect with them and deliver uh, messages and we work with Canada and Quebec as well. All right, we can go forward, Karine. So here's our staff. We have 77 members. Uh, most of them are local. So we have justice uh, projects officers. We have specialists in media and communications. We have uh, knowledge mobilization coordinators that deal with our databases and our systems for statistics and to look at our indicators. Uh, we have directors and managers, coordinators. Uh, we have uh, 
you know, KVAC officers, a number for victim support. Uh, we have a number of different uh, parts uh, of our department, some that work uh, uh, more closely with youth and others that work with adult offenders and others that work with those that are in detention. And go forward, Corinne. In our courts, this might be a typical, uh, well, this was a few years ago, but you know, 644 criminal cases, uh, 402 pre-law cases. This increased because of COVID, because we created a number of safety measures within the communities. If you violated uh, gatherings or mask wearing or or transmitting COVID, you could be susceptible to local laws. So each of the each of the communities adopted these local safety procedures. Young offender cases, although they're in youth protection court, 163. Um, there are a lot of hearings. So in March 2020, we had to take all of these cases and put them on uh, through the video conferencing system. And not only that, the judges decided that they didn't really want to use and go through the CSPQ or the RITM system, which is a very secure network. And you create these bridges between two sites. Uh, they would rather switch platforms to uh, Teams and Zoom and other forms because it was easy for them to connect in different places. And so that created a whole new area where we had to innovate quickly and try and update softwares and get around the codexes and just create links so that we could try and create a secure link as possible uh, using these platforms that were obviously third-party uh, uh, based. So suddenly we decided, well, okay, so now we have to transfer 600 or 700 cases to all video hearings. We still require people to come into the courthouse, but to stand in front of screens. And then how do we do cross examinations? Well, how do we innovate to allow them to view evidence in front of them or to view statements and to sign off on statements while, while a proceedings happening and the, the crown is in one location and their lawyers it may be in Montreal and the judge is in Amos and the court clerk or could be in Amos or could be at home or what have you. So you have multiple parties coming in and we had, uh, of course, uh, you know, we have cameras placed all over and then because of COVID, we had to put up plexiglass. And so that created issues with the sound and we had to test it and, and work all that out. But we, we, we switched uh, and we were able to, to operate for, for two years with COVID and doing uh, the majority of criminal and uh, bylaw cases and young offender cases. And of course, youth protection, it happens anyway uh, within even before COVID because it's all about uh, there needs to be an immediate solution for children that are vulnerable. So they were already using our systems uh, regularly. All right. So here's uh, some of the cases you can see in a 10 year period, how they uh, fluctuate between uh, 1300 and uh, I guess the lowest would be about uh, 600 and some during, uh, during a year, but this just gives you a basic idea of the, and, and of course we can attribute it to different uh, things in, in uh, uh, some cases it's when the, the police have changed strategies and prosecution uh, has changed, uh, you know, with programming or with uh, ways of uh, approaching things. So we can see the impacts of, uh, of, you know, community policing initiatives or what have you. All right, go forward. These are all in my annual report. So what are available to the public? So uh, we recognize that self-government and nation-to-nation -nation partnership, we invested heavily in technology, and then we had to convince the judiciary and the Ministry of Justice Quebec before COVID uh, of the significance and the importance of using uh, technology. And, that, and of course, we, we signed on to the RITM system with CSPQ managing it out of the Ministry of Justice Quebec because it created secure networks so that they could feel comfortable and it was, and it was familiar to them. Uh, otherwise, uh, without that secure system, we probably would have innovated even more. We probably would have been on platforms well before then, but uh, we wanted everything to be as familiar as possible, that we could provide the same 
uh, as they were getting within their courtrooms, uh, wherever they were in the province. Uh, the remoteness of communities, so we're saying the weather conditions impact during traveling courts. This is a problem for sometimes we would have the court show up and they would be going their next area to go, let's say it would be Nemeska or one of the other communities, and then a storm would roll in. And so what we would do is we would, you know, link up the two video systems and we would continue to invite people from that community to come and appear before uh, you know, the cameras and the screens and that, and, and we would adjust the docket and we would make sure that the winter conditions didn't impact because in the absence of that, it meant that the docket piled up. So if you were a small community that only had three or four court dates a year, and suddenly you have this docket that gets canceled, uh, then those all pile up with the next one. And so what was happening is that the more serious cases were, were being seen, but let's say if you were someone that uh, maybe, you know, had a domestic violence case, it was dragging on for two years before you were getting any sort of court date. And so, you know, it, it meant that the public perception then without timeliness would be that uh, would be that it wasn't serious enough for the court. And of course, we know that it's a serious if, if you've taken that step forward to to inform the justice system that you're uh, you're, you're uh, a victim of, of domestic violence, then it should be treated with, with equal importance of, and seriousness as you stepping forward and taking that step to change your life. Um, and then, of course, we had a need for Cree translators, as we said. You know, a lot of Cree people were sitting in the back of the courtroom and they were listening to what the judge and the lawyer were saying and what was being told to the, to the person. And they were saying to us, it's, you know, the translation is not good. So we started this project for the last five, six years with a bunch of uh, experts on the language to create a Cree lexicon or a, a Cree justice terminology guide that, uh, that goes through over 700 uh, justice phrases in the three dialects of Cree and also in French and English with, with beautiful explanations because we wanted to increase the standard and uh, of of what the, of what those hearings could bring, um, as we said, you know, a lot of the detention facilities we linked up for families. Um, for us, the oral society is less formal and fit into the culture easily, so it wasn't so. It was more a hardship for the judges and the other parties in the court to participate by video and and that than it really was for for the Cree participants because they could walk in and get their, you know, get their day in court, a timely day in court with translation and with other things, and then resolve it much quicker than, than if they had waited until, you know, the judges could come in or until they could be transported, you know, eight hours to have a 15 minute hearing and then eight hours back. And of course it took a burden on the police because the police had to transport them uh, to the where the judicial district was, which was an Amos. And as I said, there was an average of about two or three emergency hearings a week by uh, video conference. All right, uh, Karin. So we, so we are invested, like I said, very inspired by how tribal courts were using it and how other indigenous peoples were using it and the possibilities it opened uh, for our communities to kind of take away that geographic uh, barrier that was there. Of course, you know, in the alternative, we, have, we, we still uh, put forward to Quebec that uh, us having Cree judges and Cree tribal courts would be optimal because we would be there regularly. Uh, but, uh, you know, for the time being, we have this use of technology, which allows us to bring in courts and to, and to bring time in us in, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't replace the fact that uh, ideally we're moving towards having a Cree uh, court and a Cree uh, justice system. And, and of course it's not, unheard of and uh, there have been Cree courts that have been created or indigenous courts that have been created in Canada before that are all done in the indigenous language. Uh, so we installed in all of our communities, uh, some of the equipment that we received, unfortunately, switches and, and other things 
that we had gotten were end of life. And so it was difficult to find software and we had to upgrade them. And of course, one of our communities, well, next to is a flying community. So we had to use uh, satellites, uh, internet feeds. And then eventually Canada did this initiative where they put some fiber optic under uh, Hudson's Bay to connect the Inuit communities as well as our community. And now we have a, a nice fiber optic connection there, but for years it was patchy and we would uh, you know, try and figure out ways that we could uh, enhance or boost those signals so that because they needed, to, they needed to have that ability to, to do emergency hearings there instead of sending whole families you know, like on a, a three hour flight just to find out what was going to happen uh, with youth protection issues. Uh, yeah, we support simultaneous translation and everything else that you could imagine with the systems. Uh, and we have beautiful little data centers to collect data on, on everything. And what we did was originally in the design, we had all these in the center of the court. Our courtrooms are round because they're intended to be inclusive. But uh, originally we had the, this idea that we would take the monitors and have them motorized, drop down into, into the center of the court, and then everyone could see them along with the, the other equipment. And then once we saw how beautiful the round courtroom was, we changed that idea and we placed them so that they were less intrusive, so that people could appreciate the, the flow of a round courtroom. And so we put these beautiful commercial grade uh, gigantic screens on the back of the walls behind the judges and then, you know, had microphones uh, suspended from the ceilings uh, that were very non-intrusive and our cameras were, you know, up on ledges. So it wasn't really, uh, so the technology didn't overbear the courtroom, but it was there and it was very functional and useful. I think probably one of our best tests was we had a, um, we had a murder trial, uh, a, a serious crime, and the victim was from one community and the offender was from another community. And there had been a, a mistrial at the beginning because uh, I guess one of the uh, uh, one, uh, one of the rooms with evidence in it had been breached or something happened or what happened. So they had to do a retrial. And so they did it in a third community. So luckily we had it in our, uh, in, in one of our larger facilities and we composed, we brought together 300 Cree people in the lobby and we picked a jury. It was all Cree. And, uh, and then we started the trial, but we linked the video conferencing equipment to another large community where the victim's family could be. And then the other large community where the offender's family could participate as well as witnesses from those two communities. And so basically we hosted the whole session, the whole two and a half weeks of the Superior Court trial, the jury trial, in one community using technology daily to link it to the other two. So it was very inclusive. And the Superior Court at the end sent us a note and said it was the most professional trial that they had ever had. And they really enjoyed the technology that was there. So definitely a good investment. We've had a few more jury trials there and and that since then. But uh, that definitely was a highlight uh, to be able to connect three uh, places that were all, oh, I think, uh, that were at least 12, 13 hours apart from each other. So there was no way that a community could accommodate the amount of people that needed to be there or wanted to be there. And of course, the cost would have been significant, but technology allowed us to do it in a very efficient and cost effective manner. All right, uh, Karine. So as I said, increased efficiency, we could hold something at the last minute, we could share information, reducing travel, that's a big hardship because it's very expensive, even before COVID gas prices, ability to hold hearings even in bad weather. Uh, of course, we have backup generators, we're, we're the only facilities that continue to go when there's when all the hydro goes down. A reduced cost associated, uh, as we said, ability to have multiple parties uh, the negatives, of course, loss of quality of interactions. There's a little bit of issue that we have to resolve with technology, and that's like how do lawyers confer with their clients in a private manner? We thought about giving them phones, uh, a dedicated, we ordered dedicated laptops that they could connect earphones into and, and be able to talk to their lawyers or stuff when they needed to. Really, we talked with the Bar Association to see what 
they would approve or what they would think. Uh, of course, lawyers would love to cross-examine someone in person. And so the solution we offered was more cameras is to create the, is to bring in, uh, you know, an iPhone 13 has a very good camera with a stand that we could position anywhere or on a laptop. So really we had to add that to, to make that, but if it's a serious crime, we could still transport someone down. So, so if it was a, a serious enough crime that, uh, that the judge and everyone else really needed someone there, we could take a, we could take the accused and, and witnesses and, and, put them in the South and, and put them in that situation. But so it mean that would be a lot less of that happening. Uh, we have a little bit of turnover with IT staff in the North. There's so many jobs available uh, that for them to go to, especially since COVID. Um, we haven't had a lot of parties connecting from home, but we do have people connecting from different offices in, within the community uh, and different communities. And uh, there was a little bit with sound because we created round courtrooms, which were fine. That sound was great there. But we also created round conference rooms, like smaller family rooms. And in those, the, if someone had the speaker and the microphone on because the room was so small, uh, there would be a lot of feedback. And, and so we had to put clear instructions that you turn the microphone off after the judge has asked you a question. And then there was no problem. All right, Karen. So, yeah, training for all staff, confidence for staff to use it. They're often very scared that they're going to put something wrong in. But now that it's on a Teams or Zoom platform, that's much less so. When it's on a codex and when it's through a very complicated system, you have to enter a lot of numbers and do a lot of steps. So we created these guides and even guides for uh, the, court, uh, the court clerks when they came in. Uh, we would, uh, we're regularly upgrading right now. We're going to put in a whole new system now that we have, uh, uh, these new platforms and that we'd have no need for a lot of codexes. So we're going to reinvent all the systems, uh, security services. That's still a big one is, uh, a lot of families come and they can get very upset during the hearing. They can become very violent. And, uh, so when you have a court and court, a judge there, uh, you have specialized security that are there, but that security still or police still need to be there, uh, even if you're doing it by video conferencing. That's uh, that was uh, something that we had to work out with the local police. We have staff that are former police officers, but unfortunately for liability issues, the judiciary refuses to accept anyone but a peace officer to enforce their orders. Otherwise, they say they can be liable for anything that may happen from that point on. So really we need peace officers even in video conference hearings. All right, and uh, so next one. As you said, placement of speakers, cameras, inclusion of extra PCs, all the things we kind of talked about. Uh, next one. Uh, we do a lot of online educational resources. Uh, we also, to try and reach out to people, we've used a lot of media production. Did you, did you, Karine, did you want to throw up a video? Maybe the, I'll show you one of the videos we made to kind of impact people. Um, can you tell me the name of the video? Um, uh, you can do a uh, role model, the role model one. Okay. The second one. Yep. And maybe the safe one, the, the, the safe home one. Okay. Oh, 
I think you have to start it from the beginning. Yeah. But. Oh, it's a little choppy. So these are just a couple examples. So obviously that second one goes a lot smoother than that normally, but we had to be able to reach out to, uh, to people that are really connected to technology. They can watch that on their phone. Uh, actually, I think the Hudson Film Festival awarded those uh, both awards a couple of years ago, but uh, really we were just producing them to make an impact, to make people think. And sometimes when I show them in... Uh, in communities in that people are crying because they can relate to it. They feel for the child or they feel for uh, just that whole situation. So really it's about to raise awareness and use technology to kind of uh, to open, open people up a bit and uh, open up their, their conversation. Mm -hmm. All right. Next one, Karen, I guess if there's, or unless, yeah, if there, I think there's a few more. Mm -hmm. All right. So we can go past this one. Uh, as we said, we created buildings with round courtrooms. We've had judges come in and we've had the Minister of Justice come in and say, well, why is it round? And we say, well, it's round because we want to be inclusive. We want everyone to be involved in the decision. The harm caused in a community impacts more than just an individual. It impacts the entire community. Uh, just uh, on the weekend, there was a young man that was very active in a community, and he was found dead at a stop sign a few uh, a few houses away from his home, uh, not very far. He had almost made it home, and uh, he was a victim of you know some violence, and uh, it really impacted the community. And it was the second young person that was found. Uh, uh, dead on the side of a, a road in that community in the last week and a half and so we're you know like i mean the community is is really and it's not only the family that's impacted it's everyone feels uh vulnerable they feel the sorrow they feel uh you know the, the sadness and that the trauma that's caused by that and so for us with the brown courtroom it's really about a community being involved in the resolution and the healing that needs to be done from a harmful act and the many things that, uh, you know, there's many people that can add to that and many people that should be involved in the resolution of, uh, of a situation. So, so we created the physical spaces to really do that. And one of the interesting things is if you'll notice right in the center, that's where the witness or the accused stands and it has perfect volume. So that person standing there doesn't need a microphone 
they're heard absolutely every inch of that of that room. So it's also really it really centers everyone on that the person that's standing there, whether they're the victim or the accused. All right, Karen. Uh, oh, the next slide. I think we we can go through these justice committees. We created these. These are local uh, committees, and then we have a bunch of other programs that we do locally in the community. But I know that we're probably have gone a long time on this, so please let's let's end it there.